Hi, it's been around nine months since my unboxing of the chip. Time to see what issues have been fixed since my earlier review. Sheep going to dag, child. Whole eyeball hive may yawn, and hen eyeball hive all that rubberfish tutor. Blot a sheep washing crane. Yeah, eyeball can do that as whole. Eyeball goose. Whole child. Sheep need do it for bees, Sir Vice. Do eyeball hive. Do not fortake urine going out to kings. Blot! Going out to kings? Yell. Yell? Raise an eyeball, hive knit, much work hay. Were you in going? Rupert's, for his bird hay. Oh, is that too dag? Yell. Oh, eyeball, goose eyeball. Will hive get work hay him? Eyeball, think sheep better. Oh, eyeball, I'm off. Buzz. Buzz. My initial review of the chip saw a couple of issues and there were a few tests that I didn't get around to looking at, so I'll be covering them here. One of the things I didn't test out last time was HDMI video, so I ordered the official HDMI adapter, which are called DIPS. This DIP is capable of 1080p at 30Hz refresh. Connecting up the board is pretty simple, just make sure you get it around the right way. The cutoff on the corners should line up. Then connect up your HDMI monitor, and finally the juice. However, I wanted to try out the new 4.4 kernel image. So connect up the fell pin to ground and fire up Google Chrome and go to this address. If you haven't already installed the add-on, then do it now. It's all pretty much the same as last time, just that the interface has changed slightly. Then connect up the chip to your Mac, PC, Linux box or whatever you have, and then it'll start to talk to it. And eventually you'll drop into a list of available Linux images. Since I'm using the HDMI dip, the first image makes sense. Once finished, it'll tell you that you can unplug. The first order of business is to point my sources list at a local faster Debian mirror, and then update. But I kept running into issues with this, as my chip kept crashing. It would completely shut down. As it turned out, there were two reasons for this. Firstly, it seems that the HDMI dip pulls more than the configured default of 900 milliamps. You can change this by running these commands. Secondly, there's not a heck of a lot of memory on board, and it had run into issues there. So I updated the PMIC and stopped as many redundant processes as possible. I also disabled them just so they wouldn't start back up again when rebooted. I was left with just the basic processes and enough RAM to spare. Updating the source packages and upgrading then happened without issue. Since there were kernel updates, a reboot was in order. Now that I'm running 4.4.13, time to get on to some testing. Throughout all my testing, I monitored both voltage and current levels using a USB-based logger. On to GPIO testing. The latest kernel seems to have almost everything there except SPI. However, if you check the chip forums, there's an undocumented way of enabling SPI via the device tree, which comes up straight away. Nice. Then I connected up my handy dandy Max 7219 display to the SPI pins. Well, that works. No issues there. Basic GPIO and I2C worked as expected. Nothing changed there, so no need to show this test again. On to some forensics testing. I didn't want to run up a full desktop and potentially run out of RAM, so I started the X server manually. My Elgato recorder has issues with a 60Hz refresh rate of 1080p, so I have to change it manually. By the way, if you ever get this error when trying to change the screen resolution, then turn off the composite output. So in the end, the default is now 30Hz. As you can see, running GLMark2, I still had a bit of breathing room in RAM. But there were a lot of tests that either wouldn't compile, or just weren't supported on the chip. Some of the tests, of course, didn't show any change in results. For example, GLX Gears, which uses OpenGL, 
but the Mali 3D acceleration uses OpenGL ES. The ES stands for Embedded Systems and is a subset of the full OpenGL API. The CPU performance didn't change much as compared to the previous kernel, which was expected. On the Wi-Fi performance side, I saw 44 megabits per second TCP throughput and 1 millisecond jitter on UDP with no packet loss. This is pretty decent for a plain ceramic antenna. So what about current and voltage performance? While I was upgrading the chip, I saw an average current draw of 288 milliamps with a peak of 864 milliamps. Whilst installing the Pharonix test suite, I saw a peak of 943 milliamps and an average of 389 milliamps. Notice the bit at the end where voltage drops considerably and current spikes. This is indicative that my power source wasn't quite adequate for the job. While running some of the more demanding Pharonix tests, saw, interestingly, a peak current of 809 milliamps and an average of 422 milliamps. The reason for this is that no Wi-Fi was being used during the Pharonix tests. Based off the previous result, I'm assuming that Wi-Fi adds around 130 milliamps of current draw during normal use. Whilst letting the chip just sit there with Wi-Fi enabled, an idle saw a peak current of 616 milliamps and an average of 283 milliamps. This is slightly more than the Raspberry Pi Zero W at 180 milliamps. However, the chip has the potential to pull a lot more current. So the chip OS image seems to have progressed since my last review. Everything seems to work as promised from the company Blurb. However, I wouldn't try to do any real work with it as it simply doesn't have enough RAM for it to be taken seriously. It's also good to see a huge community developing behind it and support is still pretty good. I'll consider the chip fairly equal to the Pi Zero W from the support and capability perspective. However, the chip does draw more current than the Pi, so this could be an issue for some people. The Allwinner R8 datasheet mentions a super standby mode that it can enter, but there's no support for this currently on the chip. So that's about it for the review update of the chip. Thanks for watching and see you next week.